Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Studying with Brother Don. It's time again for another uh, session when studying the Word of God, and tonight we're continuing our spiritual warfare series that Brother Doug Chumley and I are doing. And tonight I want to talk about Bible study and meditation. And uh, I want to base this off of a couple of things that I, I, I want you to see tonight. And before we get into that, let's, let's, let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity and for the technology to share your word as we do. And Father, I pray we never forget the blessings that you have given us here in the United States and the way that, Lord, we're free to do these kind of things. And Father, I pray that your grace would just be upon us and that your word would be blessed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I want to begin uh, in Genesis chapter 3. If you want to open your Bibles there, that's where we're going to look at first tonight. In spiritual warfare, Satan's primary weapon against us, against mankind, is deceit. And more to the point, it's to get us to doubt God's word because God's word is, is God's word. That's God's will. It's settled forever in heaven. And Satan wants us to doubt God's word. He wants us to doubt that God really loves us and God really cares for us. And he wants us to doubt our need for God. And yes, we need God. We need a Savior. All men do. And Satan wants us to doubt that. And as we pointed out earlier in this series of studies, this is where it all started in Genesis chapter 3. And I want to read verses 1 through 3 and make a couple of points. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And of course, you know the rest of the story. She ate and she wasn't like God. Satan lied to her. Three main things that Satan did here, what we talked about. Number one, he cast doubt on God's word. Did God really say? Is that really what God said? Did God really mean what he said? He caused her to begin to doubt, to begin to question God's word. And then the second thing is, is that he told Eve she could be like God. And we've talked about this, oh, many, many times. That's what man wants. Man wants to be God. He wants to be in control of his life and he wants to be God. And and Satan deceived Eve into thinking that she could be God. And then he caused them, caused Eve, Adam and Eve, to doubt God's love and care for them. If God really loved you, he wouldn't have put restrictions on you. If God really cared for you, he, he wouldn't have put things the way he did. And when Eve, instead of just staying with God's word, when Eve began to think about these things and begin to roll them over and over in her head and meditate on these things, she began to believe Satan and she was deceived. Now, to overcome this and to stand against Satan's deception, we must know the word of God and we must understand it correctly. And I say that because if Eve had stayed with the word of God correctly, if she hadn't have played with it, she added to it, she, she tried to make it something it wasn't, and she believed Satan's deceit rather than just believe the word of God. If she had stayed with the word of God correctly, she probably would have been okay. And for you and I today, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, the, the weapon that we have, the greatest tool that we have in this life is Scripture. It's the inspired Word of God. And the Bible tells us this. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, 
a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So how do we present ourselves to God as one approved? Is it that, that we, we pray an hour a day or we give so much to the church or we do so many different things? How do we present ourselves to God as one approved? Well, the scripture says that we do it by correctly handling the word of truth. We do it by loving God's word and by spending time in God's word and meditating on God's word. For us to correctly handle the word of truth, this calls for us to spend time with the word of God. You have to spend time. You have to just set aside time and, and think about, sometimes sit down and take an inventory of your life and think about the things in your life that you make time for. These things, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to make sure that I do this. I'm going to make sure that I have time to do this. And then weigh them, those things, weigh them against eternity. And how many of those things are going to have any bearing or, or any counting in eternity? And then think about how much time you spend with the Word of God. Think about how much time you actually take to read the Word of God and to meditate on the Word of God. Think about how much time you spend cross-referencing the Word of God. Reading a passage and then studying other passages of Scripture that apply to that same passage or to that truth in that passage or to a word, a, a, a principal word in that passage. How much time do you take studying and then memorizing? Do you memorize the Word of God on purpose and then praying over the Word of God? You see, we are presented in Scripture that we are to present ourselves to God as one approved, and the way we do that is that we correctly handle the Word of Truth. Now, why is the Word of God so important to us? What, why do I make such a big deal about the Word of God, and why do I just harp on it and harp on it and say, you've got to get in the Word of God? Why is it such a big deal? Well, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, and yes, we're going to get in the New Testament here in a few minutes, but Deuteronomy chapter 32 right now, and let's look at verses 45 through 47. This is Moses, his last, one of his last speeches to the Israelites before they go into the promised land and before he goes up onto the mountain and, and dies and goes to be with the Lord because his journey, his mission is complete. And as he's speaking to them, beginning in verse 45 of Deuteronomy chapter 32, he says this, when Moses finished reciting all these words to Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. And by them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So Moses tells the children of Israel that these words that he had written down and left for them the first five books of the Bible. These words, he says, are your life. It is by these words that when you go into the promised land that you will possess it and you will keep it if you keep these words. Because he says they're not just idle words. They're not just a book that you read and then you you just set it over to the side or you throw it away. These words are your life. Listen to what? Warren Wiersbe said, he's one of my favorite writers, and, and this is what he said about this passage. He said, the word of God is the life of God's people, just as God is our life. For the word communicates to us the truth about God and his gracious blessings. To receive and obey the word of God is to share in the life of God. Now think about that for a minute. He says to receive and to obey the word is to share in the life of God. And that's what Moses was trying to tell the children of Israel. He didn't want them 
going over into the promised land and meditating on how big the enemy was or how big their armies were or how walled up their cities were. That's not what they needed to be meditating on. That was not their life. As a matter of fact, that would have been their death because they would have gotten scared. They would have just sat around and worried and eventually they would have given up. But their life was the word of God, was God's promises, was God's covenant with them that the land was theirs and that he would give it to them, was the word of God all the way through these books, how God had led them and God had protected them and God had taken care of them and provided for them. That was their life. And so when they went into the promised land and they began to fight the battles that they fought, as long as they kept, as God told Joshua in Joshua chapter one, as long as they kept their eyes on the word of God and they didn't look from to the right or to the left at everything that was going on, but focused on the word of God day and night, he said, they were successful and they were victorious. Now, most of us, when we think about spiritual warfare. We think about it in terms of temptation. That's about the only thing that we really apply spiritual warfare to is temptation. And in Jesus' time of temptation, when he was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, I want you to notice what he said. First of all, I want you to notice that, and, and you know this, but I want you to notice that every time, the three times that Satan tempted him, Every time Jesus responded by quoting scripture, he had it memorized. Now, granted, he was the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And when Satan was tempting Jesus, he was going head to head with the word of God. But in his humanity, when Jesus was tempted, he quoted the word of God. That's how he fought back. That's how he gave in. That's how he battled in spiritual warfare. And notice what he said in Matthew chapter four and verse four, in the midst of this warfare, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, that's almost what Moses told the children of Israel. He said, these words are your life. And now Jesus says that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the word of God to you and me today, just like it was to the children of Israel back in, in the days of the promised land, the word of God is our life. It's our lifeline to God. It's our lifeline to the truths, to the promises of God. It's our lifeline to spiritual warfare and to victory is the word of God. Now, I want to show you something. I've done this before, and uh, I, I hope you'll remember a, a, as we do this, but I want to show you a progression in the life of a Christian and how the word of God plays into and is the life of a Christian. First of all, it is by the word of God that we're saved. You say, no, I, I got saved by hearing the gospel. Exactly. But what was the gospel? The gospel was the word of God. It is by the word of God that we are saved. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and if, and if you don't have your Bibles, jot these down and, 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 uh, and go read these and study and meditate on them for yourself. 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 23, and hear what Peter says. He says, for you have been born again, so saved. You have been saved. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. How? Through the living and enduring word of God. So how did you get saved? You heard the word of God. You heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you believed it. You didn't question it. You, did, you didn't look to the right and to the left. At that point in your life, you were convicted that you were a sinner. You were convicted that there was no hope for you because you couldn't do anything for yourself, and you knew in your heart that you were going to go to hell if you were still in that state. 
and the word of God was presented to you, as he calls it here, a seed. And that seed was planted in your spirit and the Holy Spirit began to take that seed and teach you and instruct you and draw you. That seed began to, to bear fruit in your heart and in your life and you were born again by the word of God. And so a Christian's life starts with the word of God. That is our life. That's where it starts, with the word of God. Now, watch this. Back in, in, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul commends the Thessalonians for something. And, and, and I think this is very important because a lot of people have questions and doubt the word of God. But listen to what Paul says about the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, he says this. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. So Paul says, you, you heard the word from us. We preached it to you. And he said, you received it. You accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So Paul is telling them that when you heard me preach the gospel to you, and when you heard me come into your town and preach the word, you weren't like those that, that Athens, and, and, and remember the Greeks, they went and told Paul, they said, what is this new doctrine that, that you're talking? What is this new thing? They weren't like that. When they heard Paul speak, they said, this is the word of God. And they received it, not as Paul's word, but as God's word. And notice what Paul said at the end of the verse. He said, you received it as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So the word of God is at work in those who believe. Not only remember what Peter said, that you were saved by that imperishable seed, that of the word of God. So the word of God, even after we're saved, it is like a seed in our hearts. And if we are not reading the word of God, if we are not meditating on the word of God and memorizing the word of God, getting it into our hearts and into our spirits, then there's nothing there to grow. And the word of God, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, the word of God is living and powerful. And if we don't have it in our hearts and in our lives, then it can't work in us as Paul said it did in the Thessalonians. Listen again. He said, but you received it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So I just want to ask you a quick question. Is the word of God at work in you? When you get in, in situations and times of temptation like Jesus did in Matthew 4, is it the word of God that comes up in you? Is that where you find your strength and your foundation? Or are you sitting over there thinking, man, how can I get out of this? How can I get away from this? Why does this keep happening? That's not what Jesus said, and that's not what the word of God says. When the word of God is at work in us, when that seed begins to bear fruit, when you get in times of, of temptation, that seed bears fruit and it brings to you the strength of the word of God, a promise, a truth, a principle. And that's what you stand on. And that's how Jesus defeated Satan. And that's how Eve should have defeated Satan but she didn't because she didn't handle the word of God accurately. And after our salvation, we begin with the word of God. We are saved by the word of God. After we are saved, our daily walk, our daily Christian life, the word of God is the weapon that we are given to fight our battles. After we're saved, it is the word of God that is given to us to fight our battles. Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, and you'll recognize this immediately as the whole armor of God, Paul writing, and he says, therefore, after you have done all to stand, then put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand 
and he lists the whole armor of God. And then he gets to verse 16 and 17. And then he says this, in addition to all this, all this being the armor of God, the shoes uh, shod with the preparation of the gospel, the, the, the belt of righteousness, all, all the things that, that he has listed. He said, in addition to all of that, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So Paul tells us when we put on the whole armor of God, we're to put it all on just like God says. And then he says, in addition to that, because you see all those things, everything else that, that is given to us in the armor of God is given to us to defend us or, or to protect us. And the only weapon that we are given is the word of God. The only offensive weapon that we are given is the word of God. And so if you're not meditating in the word of God, if you're not studying and, and rightly dividing or correctly handling the word of God, then you don't have a sword. You're out there fighting in, in, in a, a war, which is what we're in with Satan and with the demons and with the, the world powers. If you don't have the word of God, you don't have a sword. You're out there basically empty-handed in the middle of a war zone. And I included verse 16 because it tells us to take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I wanted to remind you how the Bible says we get faith. So not only do we have the, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but we have this shield of faith. Now, how do we get faith? How does the Bible say that we get faith? Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you tonight, according to the word of God, if you're not meditating in the word of God, if you don't have the seed of the word of God in your heart and in your mind, you don't have faith because you can't have faith without the foundation of the word of God. Consequently, faith comes from hearing and hearing the message of the word of Christ. What are you putting your faith on or in? What are you trying to base your Christian life on? If it's not the word of God, then it's not of faith. And if the word of God is not active in your heart and in your life, then you have no seed to bear faith when you get in a situation. Are you beginning to see the importance of the word of God in our lives today? It is our life. And not bread, not air, not water, the word of God. We can't live without it. Remember now, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus warns us six times in Matthew chapter 24, his, his speaking on the end times, his signs of the time, he warns us six times about being deceived by Satan and false prophets. So again, deceit and doubt is Satan's primary weapon against us. Satan trying to get us to doubt the word of God. Satan trying to get us to not believe the word of God, to believe something else. That's Satan's main weapon against us. And without a strong and a correct knowledge of the word of God, we are susceptible to falling to Satan's deceit. Let me say that again, okay? Without a strong and a correct knowledge of the word of God, we are susceptible to falling to Satan's deceit. There are so many false prophets out there today that, that Satan is, has disguised his demons, as, as Paul says, as ministers of righteousness. And they're out there and they're holding up the Bible and they're 
preaching in Jesus' name and they're using verses and, and they're using the same language that, that born-again children of God do, but they're not speaking the truth. And Christians, if you're not careful, you'll listen to some of these guys on TV or on the radio or, or you'll read a book they've written and you'll say, well, well so that's, that's what the Bible says. That he, he quoted that verse right there. But remember what I said just a while ago when I said that we have to be spending time reading the Word, meditating on the Word, and then I said in cross-referencing the Word, understanding the whole Word. That's why what Paul said in 2 Timothy, he said rightly or correctly handling the Word of God. Not just one verse, not just one passage, but the Word of God. And when you do that, then you understand the truth of God and you know what God is saying about whatever it is you're studying or whatever it is that you're looking at. Now, along with understanding God's word, along with, with having a correct understanding of God's word, we have to be obedient to God's word. And to me, that is, is as much a part of spiritual warfare as just about anything, and that's simply being obedient to the Word of God, correctly obedient to the Word of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and I want to begin reading in verse 21 and read down through uh, verse 27. And listen to what he says, beginning in verse 21, Matthew chapter 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you, Away from me, you evildoers. Verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Therefore, everyone who hears these word of mine and puts them into practice is obedient to the word. They do what the word of God correctly says. He says, then they are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great clash. Now, notice, first of all, verses 21 through 23, what I read. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. How are you going to know the will of the Father? How are you going to know what God's will is, what God says, this is my will. This is what I want done. This is how I want it. How are you going to know God's will? Without the word, without the Bible. How are you going to know in verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, how are you going to know what to do, what to put into practice if you don't study the word of God? correctly. Because you see these people in verse 21 through 23, they knew the word of God. That they called Jesus Lord. They look at the, the things they said they did. They said we prophesied, we cast out demons, we did miracles. All of those things are they had a biblical knowledge. They knew the Bible, but they didn't know it correctly. And as a result, they weren't doing God's will. They were doing some things that they had picked out of the Bible. They were doing maybe something that was their favorite verse, and that was the only verse that they knew. But they weren't doing God's will. They weren't correctly handling 
the word of God. And what happened to them? They didn't know God's will. Paul said the same thing about the Jews in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. He said, he said man, I'll tell you what. He said, they're zealous. He said, they're excited and they're working hard. But he said, they don't have knowledge. They don't understand the word of God. Therefore, they're missing out on God's will, God's righteousness. But notice what he said in verses 24 through 25. This person hears the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. The word of God is like a seed in us that grows and bears fruit, First Peter. He hears the word of God and then he does it. He puts it into practice. And then in verse 25, when he gets into times of temptation, when the storms come, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against him. He, he was facing all kinds of trials and tribulations and temptations. Yet he stood because his house, his life, was built on the rock, the foundation, the word of God. But then the other guy, verse 26 and 27, describes what happened to those that aren't faithful and don't correctly handle the word of God. One last verse, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and you need to mark this verse, and it wouldn't hurt you if you, if you memorized it. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And listen to what James tells us. He says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. He says, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and he immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, intently, meditate, spends time with, digs in it, cross-references it, correctly handles the word of God that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. You see, Satan is not the only one that can deceive us. We can and do deceive ourselves. Look what he said again in verse 22. He said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Not only do you need to spend time in the word, you need to be obedient to the word. And let me point out something else also. In verse 21, he, he does the same thing. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. And listen to what he says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So he likens the word to a seed that is planted in our spirits. And, and it is by that seed that we are saved by the word of God. Do you see how important the word of God is? The scriptures, the Bible is, is, is your life. It's how you know God's will. It's how you know what God wants and what God expects. It's how you know what God will do and what God won't do. Because a lot of these false prophets today, they're telling us a lot of things that, that God is supposedly going to do that God never said he would do. There, as, as, as Doug, and I still I haven't, as Doug says, they're holding God to promises he never made. And if you're not correctly handling the word of God, you'll do the same thing. If we're going to stand faithful and obedient to God in these last days, if we're going to be able to discern the truth today with all of these false prophets out there, we have to be students of God's word. And we have to correctly handle the word of God and then obey the Holy Spirit's leading that seed of the word in us according to the word. And when we do that, 
we will have God's blessing, but we will have God's strength in our lives and his wisdom. And folks, that's what we need in these days. We live in dark days, and, and it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to tell sometimes what is right and wrong today because of the way things are presented. But when we rightly handle the word of truth and then we obey it, we will be like the man in Matthew chapter 7. We will be built on the foundation of rock and we will stand the storms. That's God's promise. Now that is something that God promised and he will do. He will do that. Otherwise, you're just, you're just deceiving yourself. If you think you can live the Christian life and, and fight your battles and, and withstand the onslaught of Satan in your own strength and power, then you are self-deceived. The Word of God is your life. God bless you, and thank you for being with me. Uh, next Thursday night, Brother Doug will be back for another uh, session on spiritual warfare, and I look forward to listening to him, and, and I hope you do too. God bless you, and thank you for being here.